1977, Atari was poised to release Project Stella to the public. Project Stella would be later known as the legendary Atari 2600. Priced at $659, it was still a smashing hit. The Atari was a bit of a bigger console, as you can see here. It had four switches. Power switch here, which was actually kind of a rarity because some consoles like the Fairchild Channel F actually had no power switch at all. It powered on as soon as you plugged a cartridge in. This was not so with the Atari. It also had the ability to choose the TV type, black and white or color, since not everyone was able to afford color TVs yet. There's a game select switch here that pretty much changes the game type. Most of the time, games like Asteroids use this. It changed, you know, how many asteroids there were on the screen, but either way, the aspect of the game stayed the same. And here is a handy reset switch here to reset the game. Before the Atari was actually called the 2600, it was actually called the Video Computer System. There is also a difficulty switch here for both two players. There is a channel switch here. Controllers go here. There is left controllers here. So controller ports are right here. The Atari also had a very unique joystick for a time, and it was also very handy, and very simple at that too. It just tells you where the top is here, the stick is here, and there's one button here. Simple as that, unlike the Fairchild, where it actually was rather complicated with multiple ways to move it, there's only just one way to move this. However, there was some people saying that it was damaged, it was easily damaged because people were fully uh, moving this and, you know, breaking it, but in the Atari 2600 case, uh, simple worked. Atari also released, besides the joystick, they released paddle controllers. Now, these, this is definitely used for two human players, but you pretty much had a knob to spin with here, and a button to use, just like, you know, similar buttons to the, and to the normal Atari joystick button here. Paddles were used for games, competitive games like Warlords, which was used for actually four people, and Super Breakout. One of the games the Atari came with, or the game the Atari came with, was Combat. And boy, this was a classic. You pretty much, you know, play as a tank, and this is definitely for two players, two human players. The game select switch would switch between the different game modes here. It was very popular during the time. Later on, they decided to bundle Pac-Man with it, and it sold about 7 million copies because people thought it was as good as the Smashing Hit Arcade one. Fortunately, people have said this was quite an infamous port and caused uh, some really bad events that happened in later years. We have Asteroids here, the game I talked about. The game selects what chooses this as well, changes different uh, game types. There are many different game types in this game. Um, another classic was Adventure. This was definitely a classic in, in my opinion. It's uh, I actually still don't know how to solve it to this day with the different, you know, weird looking objects and keys and things. And then Donkey Kong. This was also used for the Sears Video Arcade, which was pretty much the same name as the Atari 2600. Shockingly enough, Coleco made this, and Coleco eventually became an enemy with Atari later on. As time went by, the cartridges got a little bit bigger. As you can see here, this one has a little thing in here. Either it, it, I don't think it looks bigger, it just lo it's, they decided to make it bigger. Also compatible with the Sears video game system. Middle of the Sphinx. What mysteries lay beyond this cartridge? Anyway, then we have Air Raiders here, which I thought was Air Raid. Either way, this is a big cartridge here. And yes, it sticks out. Just like that. And then we have... What? How the hell did that get in there? Some of the items you got when you bought an Atari 2600 was a service card here. Uh, we're located in North Carolina. 
here is actually what I wanted to show you here, Fairchild. Fairchild actually made components, so the market was surprised when uh, Fairchild was releasing their own video game console. Then, in 1977, then Bally, as in Bally Fitness and Bally Casino Machines, decided to release their own video game system. Bally decided to market their video game console as a computer and called it the Bally Home Library Computer. Unlike the Atari 2600, which got much market exposure, the Bally Home Library Computer was only available for mail order and delayed their production actually couldn't let them ship out until actually 1978. By this time, Bally called their computer the Bally Professional Arcade and decided to not market it as a computer. But they became disgusted and eventually was going to sell off their products. But then another misfit company named Astrovision decided to partner up and Bally agreed and they called it the Bally Computer System. And then they changed it to the Astrocade which became the Bally Astrocade. Then, going back to 1977, a little-known playing card company, Nintendo, decided to cash in on the gaming electronics business. They released the... No, we're not there yet. Instead, they released the Color TV Game 6, which was pretty much a punk clone with six types of ways to play it. Then, jumping forward to 1978, Nintendo released the Color TV Game 15. This is pretty much 15 ways to play Pong, except this time the controllers were separate, unlike the predecessor, Color TV Game 6, which actually had the knobs on the console itself. Then Nintendo released Color TV Racing 112. It was a bird's eye view that pretty much shown you can have a steering wheel and it's the top. As you can see here, there was a steering wheel and a gear shift, and it was also you could also use Two smaller controllers could be used for other players as well. Then a German company named Intertron released the VC4000. There were many different names for this console for the region it was released in, but for the North American one, we got the Audiosonic 1292. Then the father of the first video game console ever, Magnavox, decided to release a revamped version of their Magnavox Odyssey, called the Magnavox Odyssey Square? Um, we'll just say Magnavox Odyssey 2 then. Magnavox decided to market their product as a computer as it looked as such. It was very successful and sold about 2 million units. But with popularity comes jealousy. Magnavox Odyssey 2 had a really good selling game called KC Munchkin, and it was pretty much a Pac-Man clone. Atari realized this and decided to sue. Atari won the lawsuit and Magnavox was forced to remove Casey Munchkin from the market. In a response of retaliation to Atari's legal actions, Magnavox released Casey's Crazy Chase. It was pretty much an insult to Atari as the main hero, Casey Munchkin, had to eat a caterpillar, which was a representation of Atari's greatest selling games, Centipede. Then, Magnavox released an attachment for the Odyssey 2 called The Voice. It was pretty much a speech and sound effects module that created very convincing voices for the time. The device was praised for its uh, speech sound technology that would be later used in another console, which I will talk later. Then Magnavox released a chess addition add-on to their repertoire of add-ons. This was because the Magnavox Odyssey 2 didn't have enough brains to really power a chess game efficiently. Like with the Magnavox Odyssey being as a support for other board games, the Odyssey 2 did as such, and it was very popular at what it did. Quest for the Rings was the most popular. There was an overlay that went over the Odyssey keyboard, and there was a map and other tokens to play as. Then in 1979, Fairchild came back at Atari's successful 2600 with a revamped system of their original Fairchild Channel F called the Fairchild Channel F System 2. This was directly to be competing with the Atari's 2600. It pretty much had, instead of the controllers wired in, directly like its original predecessor, the controllers could be removed. Also, the storage compartment was located and the console uh, look was changed. Also, you could shoot the sound out of the TV itself instead of the console, which made it sound better. But by this time, some really bad events were about to take place, and Fairchild decided to just can video games forever. 
Then in 1979, Nintendo released another one of their Pong-like mini built-in game clones called the Color TV Game Block Breaker. It was pretty much a mock-up port or clone of Atari's successful 2600 game Breakout. Little known by many, the man who joined Nintendo in 1977 to work on the external design of this console as his first project would be the most important man in Nintendo's future. Speaking of the block breaker, Nintendo's first consoles were only released in Japan and never saw North American shores, ever. Then a random company named APF made their own computer slash video game console called the APF Imagination Machine. The Imagination Machine came in two separate components. The first one was the actual game system called the APF M1000. The second component was the IM1 computer, and the game console went on top of the unit itself. The APF Imagination Machine was created to directly compete with the Atari 2600's success. Despite being priced around $700 for both units, a sequel was never planned as the company APF Electronics went out of business. Then, Milton Bradley, the father of many famous board games today, created the Microvision in 1979. Known by few, the Milton Bradley Microvision was the first handheld video game console to use interchangeable cartridges. I have my Microvision here. As you can see here, there's a little dial here for you to use. And the screen goes right here. The components were actually exposed quite a bit. The games were giant cartridges that went inside the unit itself. The cartridges slipped inside of here and tucked in there like that. And the user would play, you know, this overlay here would tell you, you know, where to put your fingers at, you know, the way it would work properly. And some games would use a style here, and the screen would be shown here. Actually, this game later had to be changed to Phaser Strike because Milton Bradley lost the rights to the Star Trek name. Either way, there was a couple problems with this that made this Microvision not do well, and all three problems were based on design flaws. One of them was two problems with this cartridge here, with these cartridges. One of them was the cartridges were prone to ESD. And those who don't know what ESD is, it's electrostatic discharge, like rubbing your feet in the floor and shocking your friend in the nose. This would ruin cartridges. Um, another thing was uh, this pad here, where users would normally, you know, push down here, and we would, you know, show you where to push it when the game would work properly. This pad wasn't responsive at times, so if it was responsive, you no know, users would uh, they'd push in there with their fingernails, and it would destroy this little cheap, you know material here, and they called that keypad destruction. Another problem was with the unit itself. The LCD screen goes here, but the problem was there was a issue where the screen would start leaking, and the screen would start to get dimmer, and dimmer, and dimmer, and dimmer, so you didn't see anything. And this is what my uh, microvision has. It's, it's called screen rot, and you don't the unit still works, but there is no screen to use it. There's no screen to actually use a device. Being the first handheld to use interchangeable cartridges, this was a very big feat in video game history. Then the company Bandai released the Supervision 8000. This console was only in Japan and never saw North American shores. The Bandai Supervision would work by directly connecting to a TV. One thing that made the Bandai Supervision 8000 different is what, that the Supervision 8000 had a central CPU unit. Then, jumping forward to 1980, the Japanese-only company named Nintendo released the Computer TV Game. The game was a port of the Computer Othello game, which Nintendo released in 1978 on arcade machines. Then, in 1980, Nintendo released a bunch of mini handheld games called The Game and Watch. The reason for this name was because of the... It, it could be a game, and it could be an alarm as well, hence the term Game and Watch. Many designs were produced for it, but the biggest design was probably the Donkey Kong 2 one, which 
which was the inspiration for another handheld which didn't resurface until generations later. Then Mattel, as in the toy company Mattel, released the Intellivision. It was pretty much short for calling it the Intelligent Television. It was very successful and sold about 3 million units, and about 125 games were made for the console. The keypad was a numeric keypad, but like with the Odyssey and the Odyssey 2, it used overlays to assist the gamer in playing the game easier. Then, in 1981, Intellivision had their own online service called Play Cable. You could pretty much use a cable TV system and operators could send games over uh, a normal TV signal. The people that subscribed to the service had to use a box called the Play Cable Adapter and they could play games on there. The adapter was pretty much a cartridge like any other Intellivision cartridge. And once it went on, you would get a screen of games you could download. It was like, it was, it was, a, it was a download service. The baseball player Mickey Mantle was actually the pitch man for this subscription service. Unfortunately though, as technology got more sophisticated and advanced, bigger sized cartridges were releasing, like 8K and 16K, which the play cable could not use. And eventually the system was obsolete and customers didn't like this, since it was only uh, supporting the older titles. Two years later, the play cable service was discontinued. Then, the Chinese company VTech created the VTech Creative Vision. The VTech Creative Vision wasn't just released in China, as it was distributed in South Africa and Australia, but called the Dick Smith Wizard. It was given such a name because it was sold at the Dick Smith Electronics Stores. Shortly after that, the Japanese company Epoch made the Epoch Cassette Vision. Despite the name, it used cartridges, not cassettes, even though it had cassette in its name. Controls were built into the console itself, but it wasn't that good of a seller. It made the Cassette Vision Junior and the Super Cassette Vision, but both sold with little success. After this, Epoch never released a game console ever again. Then, in 1982, the company Emerson Radio Corporation made the Emerson Arcadia 2001. Its controllers were very similar to the Intellivision, requiring overlays for them to function properly. The Japan company Bandai released a Bandai Arcadia, but there were only about four games produced for it. Little known, there are about 30 different mock-ups and clones of the Arcadia to this day. Then Coleco jumped into the gaming scene again to release the Coleco Vision to compete with the Intellivision, I'm sure. It sold half a million units. Now Atari had something to say about this, as they were working on their new project called Super Stella, and were poised to release it to the public to compete with the Intellivision and this new competitor, the ColecoVision. Then Atari released their new update to their slightly outdated predecessor, the Atari 2600, called the Atari 5200. It was a new, unique, and a big, huge failure. The adaptation of this new system was based on the inferior Intellivision with its bigger console and gigantic numeric pad-like controllers that hardly worked half the time. The biggest failure about the 5200 was that it could not play the older 2600 games, yet its other competitors and clones could actually play the 2600 games, yet Atari's new system couldn't do that. Atari realized this problem and decided to fix it by releasing a BIG-ASS ADAPTER that went on top of the big ass 5200 already. Jeez, it seems like the marketing campaign this was bigger is better or something. Oh, did I also forget to mention that the trackball was a big ass controller? Oh, the controller and the trackball was destroyed in a matter of usage because they made it so damn cheap. The power cord adapter was also a pig, which required about one to three outlets of space for it to fit properly. I forgot to mention, but the 5200 power adapter was a fire hazard and had the ability to actually bring your house down. Then Atari finally said, well guys, we effed up. They wanted to make a smaller version of the 5200 called the 5100. 
or also known as the 5200 Junior. This idea was cancelled as the 5200 lifespan only lasted two years. The behemoth price tag was $680, so that wasn't attractive either. The result of Atari's catastrophe with the 5200 only prolonged the life of the nostalgic and classic 2600. Then Commodore, the company that made the legendary VIC-20 which sold 1 million units, decided to make the Commodore Max Machine. This was supposed to be the successor to the VIC-20, but instead it was more of a downgrade. It had less expandable ports, and eventually it did not sell well, so Commodore phased it out the same year. Then the company Antex made the Antex Adventure Vision. Its selling point was it needed no external monitor required to play. One limitation was it was limited to a red monochrome color, and it wasn't really useful as a portable handheld, as it was too fragile and large to be used for such purposes. Another handheld that tried to act like a handheld, that later used the same design, failed as well later on. Then the company Milton Bradley released the Vectrex. The main selling point of the Vectrex was that it needed no external monitor to play like the Adventure Vision. The reason for the Vectrex being called the Vectrex was because the Vectrex used a vector monitor, which displayed vector graphics. And vector graphics means it displayed lines, not pixels. One thing the Vectrex had in common with the Odyssey was that it didn't have color. Instead, it used, yes, screen overlays to produce the color it didn't produce. Most of the time, the overlays just produced a blue color anyway. Vectrex wasn't released without its problems, though. One of its main issues was the game Mindstorm it came with. After a certain level, it wouldn't go any further. Milton Bradley did not advertise anything about this glitch, and you would have to directly mail the company in order to receive a copy of Mindstorm 2, which had the bug fixed. One of the big problems that Vectrex had was the ability of reading cartridges. Users would have to constantly blow on the contacts and put the cartridge in, only to be greeted with the Mindstorm screen once again. Just two months later, after the Vectrex was released in 1982 of November, the unthinkable happened. In 1983, the video game market crashed. The public wanted no more to do with anything with video games or anything related to video games at all. Why? One of the causes was the mass overflow of low quality consoles and a wide variety of consoles to choose from and also some massive failures. Another reason was strictly Atari's fault. When the arcade game Pac-Man came out, it was a hit. Eventually, they wanted a 2600 port to go with their popular console. It was made, and we got this. 12 million cartridges that were shipped of complete garbage. And this game was shipped with every 2600, so everyone felt the travesty of this infamous port. But that wasn't the end, though. Around the same time, E.T. the Extraterrestrial was also a smashing hit. Eventually, Spielberg wanted to cash out a game. With well, the aim for Christmas cash out, they only had six weeks to develop and test. Shortly after this, the game was shipped out. And it was the worst game of all time. With over two million unsold cartridges, Atari had to do something with them. What did they do with them, you ask? They buried them in a New Mexico desert filled with cement. The failure of Pac-Man and E.T. cost Atari about $536 million. Things weren't looking good for the video game industry at all. And if things weren't going to change for them, the thought of the home video game would be merely just mystery. 